Chapter 12 On Sunday morning after church, Wendy offered to keep an eye on me while Grandma worked, and Grandpa spent another day out at the fire tower. That way I could help Griffin with his scout badge work while Wendy got a few chores done. Griffin and I decided to set up our badge headquarters inside the cardboard fort. It still hadn't rained at all, so the fortress was in great shape. We dragged in a few pillows from the sofa and a whole container of Oreos, and Griffin opened his spiral-bound badge book to study our options. Since we have all day, Griffin said, I think we should work on one of the big ones. Like what? I asked, munching on a double-decker double-stuffed Oreo. My sister had been the one to convince me to try eating an Oreo like this for the first time. She took one cookie off two double-stuffed Oreos, then smushed the cream parts together to make a double-double stuff. I'm pretty sure there's no better food on earth. Griffin chewed the eraser on his pencil. For make it move, we get to create an exploding craft stick creation, recre a craft stick reaction, build a pulley and a lever, and plan a Rube Goldberg machine. He glanced up at me and wiggled his eyebrows. Do you know what a Rube Goldberg machine is, he asked. I think so, I lied. I was embarrassed to admit to a little kid that I'd heard the term, but I had never actually known what it was referring to. I think Griffin suspected I was fibbing and tried to explain it to me. Basically, there are all these separate things, right? Falling dominoes, water levers, pulleys, and whatever other stuff that work as a team to perform some simple task. Each step in the process triggers the next step, and so on. If the design works right, it's super cool to see how all the different objects work together to do something really simple. He looked at me very seriously. Get it? Um, no. I think I'll have to just show you, he said, shaking his head. It sounds fun, I said. Well, now we know what we're doing today, then, Griffin announced. Let's start by planning out our Rube Goldberg machine. If we're smart about it, we can just build the pulley, lever, and exploding thing into our plan for that. That way we'll tick off all our badge requirements in one ultra-amazing project. We each ate another Oreo, then set off to forage around in the shed in Grandma and Grandpa's backyard. That dilapidated old building seemed to be an endless source of everything we might need for any possible project. As Griffin pointed and directed me to gather up ropes, wood, a collection of small balls, a shovel, an old bird feeder, a bunch of crates, and a few other things, I asked him about school. I was beginning to really miss my friends. I'd been removed from a lot of the group texts I was usually on. Because people were planning events and get-togethers I couldn't be a part of. And some of my school friends had stopped sending me messages once they realized I wasn't ever going to write back. I never looked at Instagram anymore, and all the other social media stuff I used to waste time with just seemed stupid now. Beckett, Anne, Isabel, and June all checked in pretty regularly, but my closest friends seemed to be shielding me from regular daily stuff. Mostly, they just asked if I needed anything and wanted to know if I was okay or if I wanted to talk. I appreciated the concern, but I still didn't want to talk about what had happened and also kind of just wished they would tell me if anything interesting had happened during the last few weeks of school. My regular life had started to fade into the background, and it was getting harder to imagine ever going back. How would I ever fit in there like I had before after so much had changed? I'm glad it's almost over, Griffin said, his face falling. Don't you like school? He shrugged. Not really. I'm not very good at it. How is that possible, I asked. You're brilliant. Tell my teacher and my mom that, he said. I tilted my head to one side, waiting for him to go on. Okay, so here's what I mean. I can memorize almost anything, he said, his arms loaded full of crates of supplies as we trundled out into the yard. You can test me, even. My mom's grocery list, the scouting badge requirements, the TV schedule batting stats of every Twins player. But spelling words? I fail those tests every week. But spelling tests are just simple memorization, I said. I know, he said, sighing, and it's even worse in math. I look at all those numbers and they just kind of jumble together into soup. My teacher told my mom I'm struggling and not up to grade level in half the stuff we're doing, and now she's all worried about me. He pushed out his lips and blew a raspberry. Anyway, that's why I'm trying to finish all the scout badges. I want her to know I'm good at something. 
She's really smart, my mom. But my dad? I guess he was kind of a dud. He cringed. I heard my mom say that to your grandma one day, that my dad is a dud. It's kind of a funny word, but I don't think she meant it in a funny way. Yeah, I said, chewing my lower lip. I think you're probably right. So if I finish all my badge work, I'll get honored at the fall den meeting, and my mom will get to stand up when I'm presented with all those new patches. She'd like that, to see everyone clapping for me, celebrating her awesome son. My teacher's son is in Scouts, too, so she'll be at the meeting, and then she'll find out that I'm not bad at everything, just the things she makes me do. I nodded. Okay, I said. I could understand that. I'd felt the same way lately, too. I was desperate to show my parents how well I was handling my summer banishment to Thistledo. It would feel so good to have someone notice the things I was doing right. That makes sense. But you do know you're not a dud, right, Griff? I dumped my armload of supplies onto the ground in the backyard. Bear sniffed around at our collection, picked up an old tennis ball from the center of the pile, and trotted off to chew it on the other side of the yard. Of course I know that, Griffin said with a haughty sniff. I just want to make sure everyone else knows it, too. I laughed. That's good. Griffin and I stood quietly together for a minute and watched Bear, who was now tossing the ball into the air with his mouth and then chasing after it. It was probably the saddest, loneliest game of fetch I'd ever seen. I just got an idea, Griffin said, grinning. How about we make it so our Rube Goldberg machine throws that ball to Big Bear? Then he can be part of the project, too. That sounds complicated, I told him. You doubt me, he asked, wiggling his eyebrows. If you say it can be done, I said, holding my hands up, I believe you. Show me what I need to do. It took all afternoon and a trip to the Y store to see Grandma so we could each get a chocolate ice cream cone for energy and focus, but we did it. By the time Grandpa's motorcycle crunched onto the gravel in the driveway, Griffin and I had built, rebuilt, and successfully tested our Rube Goldberg machine at least several dozen times. To get the process rolling, we had made a swinging pulley out of rope and a tiny garden shovel. Once it was swinging, the shovel knocked a softball off the top of a pile of stacked up wooden crates, sending it careening through a tube made of old rusted metal downspouts that someone must have taken off the gutters on the house. The ball rolled out of the metal tube and knocked into a two-by-four scrap board, which set off a domino-style knockdown of even more two-by-fours. The final board kicked over a rake, which in turn crashed into a little red wagon. After being set in motion by the rake, the wagon rolled across the grass and slammed into a huge snow shovel that was hanging by its handle at one end of the clothesline. The shovel zipped down the slippery clothesline, acting just like a zip line. At the other end of the clothesline, the scoop on the shovel worked like a giant bat and thwacked into an old t-ball tee that had the tennis ball perched on top, ready to sail out into the yard. It took a bunch of tries for us to get all the parts of our design to work fluidly together, and I was shocked that Griffin never got frustrated or gave up. He would just tinker or ask me to fiddle with something, and then he'd think for a second before making a few adjustments that seemed to solve the problem almost perfectly the next time we tested it. Bear was so excited when the whole thing worked out as it was supposed to. Whenever our Rube Goldberg machine worked without hitting any glitches, the shovel knocked into the ball with serious force and sent it flying for him to fetch on the other side of the yard. He'd chase after it, then bound back and stand in front of me or Griffin with the ball clutched in his teeth. I couldn't wait to show Grandpa what we'd made. As soon as he'd parked the motorcycle, I called for him to come over. I met him just as he came around the side of the house. Are you ready to see something amazing? I asked, grinning madly. Grandpa stood back, arms crossed over his chest. Drum roll, please, Griffin called. I tapped my hands on my thighs, the closest thing I could get to a drum roll sound. Then Griffin swung the little metal shovel and set our Rube Goldberg machine into motion. First the shovel pulley, then the ball slide, the wooden dominoes, rake to wagon to zip line, everything went exactly according to design. When the shovel slid down the clothesline and thwacked into the tennis ball, Bear scurried after it, collected the ball, and returned it, dripping with saliva, to Grandpa's feet. Ta-da! I exclaimed. Griffin and I designed the whole thing ourselves. Isn't it impressive? 
Grandpa poked the tennis ball with his foot, nudging it away. That sure is something, he said, in the same tone of voice he might use if we'd successfully colored a page in a coloring book or put on matching socks. It was a little annoying that his level of enthusiasm did not match our level of engineering mastery. But if I learned anything about Grandpa since arriving in Minnesota, it was that he didn't waste words just for the sake of saying something. And even though he didn't say it out loud, I could tell he was impressed. But I guess more importantly, I was proud of us, and sometimes that mattered even more. As soon as Griffin left for dinner and his fourth Sunday night shower, I called my parents to check in. We stopped by the house with some friends today, Mom told me, to see if there was anything we could salvage out of the ruins of the fire. Dad jumped in behind her on the screen. Almost all of your and Amelia's baby and toddler pictures survived the fire. Thank goodness we moved them into our bedroom during the basement construction, Mom added, her smile looking more real than it had all week. We were also able to pull out a few kitchen appliances that should be usable, and the dining room table somehow looks okay. I let out a breath I hadn't realized I'd been holding in. I guess I'd started to assume that every piece of our old lives was gone. Knowing that a few pictures, the fridge and the dining room table, where my sister and I did all our homework and played table football and made our Play-Doh feasts, had made it through the fire was oddly comforting. It didn't sound like much of the house structure was intact or safe to walk in, so my parents were working with the insurance people to figure out what our options were. Either we'd try to fix what remained, or they would have to tear it all down and build a new house from the ground up. Mom and Dad had been staying with friends and sleeping mostly in the hospital for the week after the fire, but now they were living in an extended-stay America hotel room. It's a good thing you're not here, Dad said lightly, obviously trying to make me feel better about everything I'd been missing. Our room just has one double bed, and the TV options are not great. That's too bad, I said. Eh, Dad said, we're not there much, just to shower and change and take a nap or take turns grabbing a full night's sleep every once in a while. He settled into the chair in the corner of my sister's hospital room, since Mom had moved out of the frame. He asked, So, what's new with you? We miss you, Maya. I've been waiting for him to ask so I could tell them all about the past few days. Even though I hadn't made it any farther up the fire tower that week, I did actually make it into the water at swim lessons on Thursday. Griffin and I had made a pact that we would try to do everything our teacher Evan thought we were ready to do, which is how we ended up wading out until we were each shoulder deep in the water. Then we picked up our feet and let our bodies dangle in the lake, making it feel like we didn't have solid ground below us anymore. Maybe it was wearing the life jacket, or maybe it was the promise to myself that I'd try to find some of, to shed some of my fears and help Griffin during our lessons. But I actually did it, and I could even imagine floating out in the lake some day, or bobbing around, playing catch in the deep end of the pool with my friends without a life jacket. I'd never realized how much I wanted to do those things until they actually felt like a real possibility. I'd been so excited to tell them about all of that, and the view from the first landing on the fire tower, and how I was teaching Bear how to be a pet, and me and Griffin's Rube Goldberg creation. But mostly... I had been eager to show Mom and Dad how well I was handling things, getting brave even, so maybe they would see that I was ready to come home. But almost as soon as Dad asked his question, a doctor came in the room to chat with my parents about another skin grafting procedure Amelia was having done later in the week. Skin grafting, I'd recently learned, is where they take healthy skin from one part of my sister's body and use it to help heal some of the most severely burned areas. She'd already gone through a few of these surgeries, but Amelia had more of them ahead of her, and I knew my parents had a lot of questions. With an apology and a promise to talk tomorrow, Dad hustled off the phone, so I didn't get to tell them anything at all.